I'm Bruce Christensen, a Christian inventor, and I did not start out as an inventor in my years of work, but I got into it and finished, uh, retired, and I'm here to tell you today about how that all happened. I was, I, I attended uh, Delphian Academy, and I attended an EMC, and my whole career, life up to that point was that someday I would, well, I'd have thought about being a dentist, but uh, I also got into other things, and so I decided, well, I'd like to teach. And in my senior year, I uh, got more interested in that. And then I came to college, and they don't have uh, classes in engineering, and I didn't really know what engineering was. All I knew is I kind of enjoyed uh, physics and chemistry and things like that. In fact, my teacher in the last year, I took as a senior, I took a class of, in physics, uh, advanced physics or whatever, and part of it was there was a search for young people in those days who were, uh, it was a national search. Uh, and you could apply and see if you could win some money or win some recognition. So uh, my friend and I, we both were there in physics together, and we took the exam. There was quite an extensive exam. And we had a project, and I developed a little project, uh, and we turned all of that in. Much to our surprise, because we didn't think coming from a a non-science uh, school and just ordinary people that we'd ever win anything. Fortunately, or as the Lord was leading, I was chosen as one of the top 400 in the nation. Uh, and it was, but I was not high enough to be eligible to go for a final exam for, to narrow it down. But it was published, uh, and it came out in the local papers and so forth. And from that, uh, when I came here to EMC, they gave me a scholarship uh, that helped with some of the expenses. But in those days, I think the scholarship was only $50 or $100, something like that. Not like today. But anyway, uh, that kind of swung my interest a little more heavily into the idea of teaching uh, other young people uh, about physics and chemistry and so forth. Because I, I was his lab assistant for chemistry and, and uh, all. So I enjoyed that. Came to Andrews, which was EMC at that time. And uh, because of the war situation, I, I came to summer school in order to hopefully ev evade the draft. Uh, by being a science teacher. I took uh, two classes that summer, uh, one in English and one in uh, zoology, because uh, that was all that was available. And anyway, I finished four years of college uh, with a degree in physics and chemistry and, and math. Uh, so the first summer after my graduation in 1949, I was out looking for jobs in one of our academies as a science teacher and uh, not having any uh, replies or at least there was no openings. But finally at the end of the summer I got a uh, call from uh, Jefferson Academy in Texas. Uh, they wanted a science teacher. I don't recall if they told me but they ended up having me also be the Dean of Boys. I'd never done that, except to live through that. <laughs> and, but I went down there in my Model A Ford, drove for three and a half days, and finally got there, partly on dirt roads. There weren't any, many paved roads then, and so forth, but I got there with enough oil and, my car took almost more oil in it than did gas, but we got there. And uh, then I, f I think that's when I found out that they wanted me to be Boys Dean. And uh, so I had a room in the boys' dorm, 
and there was a girls' dorm elsewhere on the campus. And then they had a, a, I believe it was a church that was converted to have uh, three, four, uh, three classrooms in the library and then a meeting hall. So uh, one thing that I was told at that point was uh, they were going to a class in chemistry. And, uh, but I'd never taught chemistry, I'd taken it, but I didn't know uh, all the materials would be needed and the textbooks to choose, and they said, that's what we want you to do. Figure out what you got to have and so forth. I was a little disturbed because meanwhile, the principal and somebody else were out back of the boys' dorm doing some repair work on the building, uh, maybe even roofing or siding, because I had done both. And I felt much more comfortable if I could have been helping them, but no, I had to get this uh, order in before school because they wanted to order the supplies. They had not had a lab. I was to set up a total lab and everything. So I got it together. And uh, I guess I tell you this because it shows that even though you're trained for one thing, you may not use it for that thing, but something else God had in mind for you to do. So I, uh, chemistry was to be second semester. First semester I was to teach biology. Fortunately, I'd taken zoology, so I knew a little about it, but, but this was a little different. And I was also supposed to teach Old Testament history. The math class I would rather have taught uh, they had an elderly lady that was been doing that for years or whatever, and they weren't about to move her around. So I, I, had, I set up a terrarium and taught the kids biology. And we arranged field trips, and, uh, which I'd never done before, but we did it and had a good time. And uh, partway through the year, they decided that somebody came by selling musical instruments. And I did play a clarinet, and I had played a clarinet here in the band in EMC, and also at the academy. So I was a little acquainted with that. May, these people were successful in convincing quite a few of these people, which I didn't think had much money, to buy instruments for their kids. And uh, apparently this guy was going to teach them because I didn't know how to play a trombone or even the drums. Or I just knew how to play clarinet in a band with somebody else leading. But I was going to be the leader of the band. So uh, they got them some training and so forth. And then at a point, why I don't know whose idea it was, that the, but the community wanted to hear some results. So we wanted to have the band to play for one, the next home and school meeting. Well, the band members didn't feel too comfortable with that, and neither did I. And uh, so we worked it out that uh, there was one of the uh, rooms next to the auditorium was the library and also the classroom for biology or for Old Testament history. Yeah, and uh, there was a door to the platform from the Old Testament classroom. So the students said, can we just play in here and open that door and let them hear us? And that's what we did. So our first appearance was not an appearance, <laughs> but they heard our music that we, and they seemed to be satisfied. Through the year, things begin to deteriorate somewhat. Some of the kids didn't come back and some uh, whatever. And it was a small group to start with. And it was interesting dealing with the boys, uh, but we made it. And so by the end of the year, they decided to close down the uh, dormitory facilities, but still have a local church school. So they wouldn't need me. So I took I meanwhile sold my Model A and uh, took the train back. And uh, shortly after I was back, why I proposed to my wife, that maybe, wife to be, that maybe we ought to get married. 
So we decided to do that. Um, we went on a honeymoon and went to uh, see my dad, who was taking uh, uh, schoolwork uh, toward his doctorate degree in uh, Chicago. He'd been a teacher there, or not a teacher, he'd been a preacher there uh, at Humboldt Park Church. And while he was there, he was taking some classwork. Uh, I had a job with a roofer during that summer. And when we got married at the end of July, why I told them I was wanted to take a week off for honeymoon. And I uh, thought it was all arranged. So when I came back from the honeymoon, went to work the first day, they said, what are you here for? We didn't expect you back. We don't have a place for you. <laughs> I didn't have a car then. I had ridden to work with somebody. I had to ca call my wife and, and she got somebody's car and come up to get me. <laughs> So life is unexpected at times. And uh, <clears throat> so that was when we got acquainted with a young man who was working in engineering. And uh, he said to me one day, have you ever thought about being an engineer? And I said, I don't know anything about it. Uh, uh, and I, don't, I have never taken drawing lessons for the dra drafting work because he said, we've got a job for a draftsman. He said, here, take this textbook, drawing textbook, and just make some of the sample drawings they have and do the best you can and let's see what you can do. So I made the drawings and gave them to him and he took them, showed them to his boss and they said, Fire, let's hire him. So I had a, a job, the first job in my engineering career at that point. Uh, they gave me a drawing board, which I'd never worked on before. Big drawing board, six foot, I think it was. And uh, gave me a drawing to make for a part. Uh, the first drawing I made was this part, it was a fan. The fan that cools the motor. And uh, my friend who had got me the job was in charge of a group that was <coughs> making large scale uh, forklift machines. Uh, Y-150 they called it, I think it was a 15,000 pound capability machine, large one. And uh, he was in charge of that project and he'd give me drawings to make for that. And uh, along the way then he uh, was given the responsibility for uh, uh, a couple of new machines that they would sell to factories that would drive through the aisles in the factories. Instead of a forklift, you just load supplies on these little trucks. And one was <coughs> electrically driven, and I'd not taken that much electrical training, so I didn't know much about that. And uh, the other, second one was a gas engine machine. He says, here, I want you to help with the design of these machines. And uh, the design was pretty well long, but it's, uh, they hadn't worked out some of the details on the controls and stuff for the electric machine or uh, the same for the gas machine. So I worked on those and uh, he helped a lot. And I, he was teaching me, I guess. And uh, then I don't remember the details of why but the, that business began to shut down and Clark, uh, who was who I was working for, Clark Equipment Company, uh, was looking for a new business in other areas. And in particular, they had an interest in construction machinery ma equipment, uh, front end loaders, graders, cranes, that kind of thing. And there was a company here in Michigan that was called the Michigan Crane Company so they bought the rights to that company and brought it all out and brought in a small group of experienced engineers that they got from someplace uh, that had experience in front end loaders in particular with, uh, I think these were probably, well, I'm not sure what company they were working for, but anyway, 
they came in and uh, so my boss said, uh, they need a draftsman. So I want you to go work for them. And they were in a building across the street from where I was already. And incidentally, I was with Clark Equipment in uh, Buchanan, Michigan. And uh, they, they were there. And they, at that time, they were a large company in Buchanan, for those who know of the history of Buchanan a bit. And much of Buchanan was occupied with their people and their equipment and their machines, their buildings, and so forth. So uh, the building that I was assigned to is still there. Uh, the other building, I think, is gone now. But um, So I worked for these people doing drawings for front-end loaders, because they, they that was the first thing they were going to do, was design front-end loaders for the company. It was kind of a takeoff from uh, forklifts and that type of thing, so it was somewhat related. But it was different in the application. But anyway, I worked for that for a while, and they got another man in, and it moved me back to another building uh, that was designing. Uh, well, he was working on this front end. Well, he was interested in dozers, uh, rubber tire dozers. And so I was working for him, uh, beginning to apply some of the things I had learned from working for the other the loaders. But also he got the request to design, they wanted us to design a, uh, I, I don't remember what the name they had for it was. I'd call it kind of a, 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 a semi-truck mover. It was going to be, uh, it was coming in uh, the, the days of hauling uh, freight in the front, in the, in these machine, in these, uh, uh, Oh, I can't think of the name again. Uh, but they were saying, let's move these on the flat cars on the train. But we need a way to get the, the semi onto the flat car. So they wanted a design of a little machine that would go under the nose of the semi and catch the pin that was there and then drive it onto the... So I was to design that little flat car, that little car to do that. It was kind of a neat little job, and and but we had to figure out the mechanism and do. So I was starting to get into designing, but I was under the leadership of a good boss. And uh, meanwhile, my friend had, uh, I think he went off into anyway. Uh, something else, and, but we kept in touch through the years. But Clark Equipment at, at Battle Creek was where he moved to next, and then eventually he was let go from there, uh, or retired from there, I don't know which, but anyway. So we'd see him occasionally and keep in touch. But, uh, so I was working on that, but this man was, was, spo was supposed to be working on dozers also, and so uh, he had me helping with that. But meanwhile, there had been a front-end loader guy um, that was in the desk next, I, I don't remember the timing here, so I may be a little bit off in the timing, but uh, he, uh, there was a, a older man, a large man, and he was uh, designing a small front-end loader with a shovel on it and so forth. And uh, so he needed a draftsman. So I was doing drafting work for him. The interesting thing here is how God moves to help you forward in, in what you're doing. So he was inventing this machine. Uh, I think what I was just told you was actually after that, but um, it was in the same building, but in a different setup. But anyway, um, he was known to be a man who liked to drink. And he would many times come to work with not all his faculties very strong. 
And one day he came in and he was supposed to be checking out these drawings that others had made and that they were all going to fit together for the final production. And he said, you know, I'm having a time here today. He said, why don't you come over here and, and you check these drawings out for me. So I did his work for him. I worked for him long enough to kind of know, but, and from those drawings, they built the first front end loader for the company. And they drove it around out back and tested it and so forth. It worked. <laughs> uh, and it may have been after that that I did the little tug machine to move semis, but it was in the same building, but a new boss. Meanwhile, they were deciding that it was time to, this organization was growing and the construction machinery division of Clark Equipment Company was beginning to form and that they needed their own building. And so they found property and built a building up in the Benton Harbor area, which is still there. You can drive by and see it there. Um, a nice building, brand new building. And the nice thing about it, it was going to have well known. So somewhere uh, along the way here, the man in charge of that building uh, came to me, I guess, or maybe my boss, other boss did, I don't know, they were together kind of anyway, uh, and said, you know, we're going to have to set up an engineering department there in, a, in the upstairs floor, and uh, we want you to go up there and get acquainted with the layout and decide what we got to do, uh, how many boards we can get in there and people and offices and so forth. So now this was something, you know, I was not an architect, but uh, I was now being given an architect's job, I guess. And uh, so uh, I went up there one day when the boss was there, and it was a hot day and so forth. And when we had been working in Buchanan, they had just put in air conditioning. We were right next to the, in Buchanan, we were right next to the factory. And uh, it, during the summers, you, we'd open all the windows and the factory dust would come in and get on our drawings and we would smear our drawings and it wasn't good. But finally, they broke down and bought some air conditioners and they got that working right. Just about that time when I was getting moved to this new building, but it didn't have air conditioning. And I went to the boss and I says, you know, we should have, oh, he says, that's no problem, he says, we, we open our windows wide, we're near the lake, and we'll get the breezes off the lake, and it'll be comfortable and be fine. So I didn't win on that one, but anyway, uh, <laughs> we went ahead and got people moved and everything and organized. And so then I was given the job of designing a, the next larger machine front end loader from the one that had been done as a prototype that I had worked on earlier. And uh, that one was more or less under my control. We did have a, a, a supervisor that helped some uh, who had come. He started with them in Buchanan and came with that, that group from another construction company, competitors. And he was there. But he was, uh, at that point, they're saying, well, you know, we're going to have our own drawings. We need to have our own pre-printed labels on our drawings and we need to have parts lists and format these. So he was sitting in the back of the room because I had it arranged that the leaders were in the back and the workers were in the front in the room. And uh, so I was ahead of him a couple tables, but that's where I worked. And so he was working with that problem of parts lists and so forth. And meanwhile, I was designing the machine and he'd look over my shoulder and tell me whether I was getting it right or not. So we got it together and uh, that machine went into production. Uh, so the invention part began to t come into play at that point. Because in designing this machine, uh, this was going to be a front end loader. And so we designed it that way. And uh, there was uh, some questions as to how are you going to make that bucket tip and control that. And so that was one of my first inventions was a possible way 
which I don't think we ended up using because they also, by the way they arranged the geometry of the arms, uh, they would do the necessary bucket. And then they had a separate cylinder that they could release and dump the bucket. But anyway, uh, they got that going and then uh, the, we had gotten, meanwhile, a new, um, well, the fellow that had worked with, with me before on uh, possibly a dozer type thing was now more or less the chief engineer. And uh, he said, let's take that new, new shovel machine, turn it into a dozer. And so now I, I was to take the basic chassis and the wheels and the engine transmission, all that could be the same. Uh, but we had to have our own uh, structure and our, a blade and a push arms and to work all that off from the, st the structure that was there. Uh, so that stressed my, meanwhile, I had uh, had the opportunity to take some classes in the evening uh, while we were still in Buchanan. And I also later took some more uh, through the University of uh, Michigan, I believe it was, Michigan State. Uh, yeah, it was Michigan State University who had offered engineering classes in St. Joe area. But earlier I had taken a couple of classes in uh, strength analysis and uh, design of things like that that I'd never had any training in, but except that I knew that steel had certain properties and uh, I finally learned how that you can apply knowing that to putting it together to make things. And so uh, I designed a triangular structure to come off from the frame to end in a ball that would be captured with clamps and go forward in a push arm to push the blade. And then I had a cylinder up there that would tilt the blade as needed. And I had to work out the hydraulics and the all. Oh, but the big thing was the structure of that piece. And it was to go down between the tires. Before that, the front end loader, the arms, were between the tires and the frame. But this they wanted to be the push arms to be outside of the tires, which meant I had to get off from the structure out there to that ball to push that. And I had to design that to take the stress of ramming into stuff and doing whatever they do with dozers and don't care what the designer designed it for. <laughs> so uh, that was, uh, Pretty well one of my early inventions was how to do that and how to make that uh, tip. And uh, so one thing just kind of led to another. Um, they had me start on another larger machine yet that they had already done as, as a uh, front end loader. And uh, that machine, they wanted a do dozer version of that. So I used what I'd learned and applied it to that. And then, uh, the, but after I pretty well got it along, they brought in another engineer and said, he, let him take care of this and you go on with something else. Well, the something else that began to sh turn up in all of this was, uh, You've got, we've got to manage this department of some 40, 50 people. Uh, and we've got a blueprint department and we've got uh, all kinds of uh, paperwork that we have to do. And uh, I think you could help us with that. And uh, so at that time, we didn't have any copiers. The girls would type but they had to use up to six, I think it was six carbons. And if you made a mistake, you had to go back and either retype it or try to erase it off from the in-between ones, and so forth. And so uh, they were, copiers were just starting to come out. And so they said, why don't you look into that and see what we can do? 
to improve things. So I got copier people in and got the girls the idea, wow, this is great. We top one copy and then we just run it through the copier. And uh, at that time they were also using a, another method for uh, distributing to, because we had, uh, our company was an over, uh, international company. And we built a lot of stuff and shipped it over and we also sent the design drawings over for them to make the parts there, wherever it was. Some was in South America and some was in Europe. Um, and so they were sending copies, blueprints, uh, that they would make. And uh, we did, when we were in Buchanan, they had a wet process blueprint machine, the old fashioned regular, the prints that came out were blue with white lines. But about that time that I got involved with it, there were newer machines that worked off from were, uh, what they call diazo uh, and uh, ammonia developed machines from light sensitive paper. So those were white prints, they weren't blue prints, but the lines were, were blue or black, depending on what you got. So um, we got that going. Uh, and we had the uh, offset, we had a small offset press machine that they would print parts lists off from on and, pick, and they could make multiple copies for letters and stuff to send overseas. Uh, going on from the designing process, um, along the way you come up with these new ideas and a company to protect its expenses has to do something to protect that design, uh, concept or design. So I got involved with uh, several situations that developed new things, and these were run by our legal people to see if they were, because there's two things to be considered, that you aren't redesigning something that's already been designed, which you technically can't do without paying the other guy some dues. And of course, the new company not wanting that uh, checked out our, our designs that they were not, uh, they were something new. And so the positioning system for the front end loaders uh, was, uh, there were positioning systems that others used, but this had to be different. Um, I don't think it ended up getting used. They still liked the way the others did and it wasn't patented, so uh, it was a, two bar linkage uh, and so forth. But in a way, uh, but when we got into the little larger machines and a fairly good assortment of machine sizes, and incidentally, the, probably the last machine I designed was, uh, was at the time the largest of the machines. Uh, I have a picture of it, but I didn't bring it with me. Uh, it had, um, two radiators to cool the engine instead of one. Uh, it was a mammoth machine. The frame was two inches thick by about, uh, I forget now, 15, 16 inches deep. Uh, but that was not a problem for a dozer because you want weight. And so in process, however, there are times where they put want more weight on the machine and a lot of other machines do it by putting special uh, hub gaps with extra weight in, but uh, they really wanted all that weight up front. So one of my inventions was how to make a removable weight that would go on the front in the space that we had available. And so I came up with a flat, uh, I think it was about a two inch thick piece of steel that stuck out in front like a tongue and then, uh, but you're gonna put a casting on that and how you're gonna, you're gonna say. so we designed it so it would fit inside of a casting because we had to know the casting technology in order to know what we, you know, what we can design and, and we wanted it so you didn't have to machine it and so they could make a hollow space there and this could be slipped on and then they could have a core through the middle uh, and they would put a big bolt in there and that would keep that big weight on there. And I forget now what the weight weighed, but it was 
uh, I don't know, 1,000, 2,000 pounds. I mean, it wasn't light because this machine was big. The blade on the machine, by my memory, was probably, I think, 12, 14 feet wide. And it was several feet tall. It was three, four feet tall. Four feet, I think, at least. Uh, it was, it weighed around 100,000 pounds, the whole machine. And it was, these kind of machines were used in uh, coal pits and, and also in the iron ore areas, in the mining operations, where they would take off topsoil down to a point and then get the coal out. And uh, they needed these big dozers to push lots of, lots of, coal up into piles to be picked up then by uh, loaders that could be put it into there because they also had a big loader that they designed that at first uh, that was followed what I designed but it was based on instead of basing the machine design on a loader we turned it around and based a loader on a design of a dozer but anyway that uh, was the way that was done. But along the way, uh, there came the time where uh, competitors, well, you're pushing dirt around, but you freshly, ex freshly uh, push aside dirt is pretty soft and you sink in it and so forth. They said, we've got to have a compactor of some sort to pack that dirt down. And, uh, Caterpillar, I think, at that time had come out with a set of wheels that had steel pads instead of a tire, uh, and that would roll back and forth across the dirt and pack it. So they wanted us to do the same thing. Well, how do you make a steel pad different? I mean, a pad's a pad, and how do you get something that you can get a patent on? because there is value to a patent in that it keeps others out of the business of doing that same thing and makes it your machine more attractive possibly to sell it better. Whereas if you don't have that or you have to use somebody else's patent, it costs you money or you get, you get uh, uh, lawsuits and so forth. Well, that, all of that happened when they wanted these compactors, compactor wheels designed and they said, here's what the competitors do. You make a design. And uh, at first, uh, they didn't realize it, or nobody asked, and I, I didn't. I was told to design something. And, and uh, I saw they made pads, and they were all the same size, and, uh, and ring arrangements around the wheel. And so I did the same thing. Why reinvent it, you know? But nobody had said that you couldn't. So we made a machine and or made a set of wheels, put them on one of our machines, and sent it out the west coast, I think it was. And um, it wasn't long we got our, our attorneys were bugging us and saying, you know, Caterpillar attorneys have been after us that we're, we're uh, using their patent and we need to pay them or, or forget it. So we had to destroy those wheels. Then the question was, well, can we design a wheel? And I said, well, you know, they designed their wheel so the pads were all in a row. And then there'd be a space and then all in a row, all the way around the wheel, which kind of made sense and so forth. So I said, well, let's, let's pull on them and we'll now make it every other row. And that's how inventive you have to get sometimes. But I was staring, I mean, everybody was staring the answer in their face, but you, you know, you, you get that thought. So the, the reason that made sense was not the appearance. We couldn't really get a patent on it on appearance, if I remember right. But I said, look, if they're this way, you're pounding, you're, you're, all, you're putting the full weight on one set of, of, of uh, pads as you go around, 
and it's you're not really packing anything you're just kind of rolling over it and it says if you make them so they're if you make them so they're every other like that then they're one set is putting load on and then there's no load and then the next set is offset different and that's a different load so the load varies and you now get the effect of a tamping machine and that's what we got the patent on and uh, so in the uh, you don't design a lot of patents on purpose but you also design them sometimes to get around problems and we, that's what we did in that case um, and so that's what the compact wheel then there was cleaners that have to go between them to keep the because you go with the mud builds up and so forth so uh, out of that I got a trip out of California uh, I'd been taking trips on other things but I know I went out there met the fellow that was they were working on uh, the dam the Chico dam it was an earthen dam and they were building it above um, Sacramento I think is the town and they um, they were uh, moving the dirt around with our equipment and, and and they had some of our dozers and so forth there and they wanted me to see the job and see uh, what we had to do with the compactor wheels and stuff so I did and saw that I was just interested lately I forget who it was now but went by that area the dams there and still holding I guess <laughs> so did a job but um, I don't remember what was the unique problem with the um, cleaners, but uh, just like everything, you had to check it through. You were supposed to check it through with the uh, legal people. The hard part for me as an engineer, I I didn't have much trouble, but twisting my mind around different ways to do things with steel and so forth. But the legal people would write up a, a long dissertation describing this patent and what it's for and all, but they didn't know anything about engineering. And so they would bring that to me and say, here, read this over and tell us if we've missed anything. Well. I was trying to read legal talk and they were trying to talk engineering talk and uh, interesting experience. Plus it was very uh, labor intensive trying to read that. So you don't know, you know, many times you think when you're starting out in, in, in your new first job that that's what you're gonna do the rest of your life. Things that you do in later life, you don't know that they're gonna come and I lived through the time when there were no computers to the time when computers are back and even today they're even going further and further. Uh, the interesting thing was that as we went along there was a lot of, we had a lot of good engineers and uh, my boss saw, thought I, I would be a good man for figuring some of this stuff out. So he came to me one day and he said, you know, we're getting computers are starting to come. And uh, I think it would be good if you could learn, we'll send you to school, learn all about the computers and help us to get the right computers and do the right things for our department. So then's when I got out of the designing business and got into managing uh, a department I didn't actually manage the department, but I was involved in the way the department utilized its information and tools. And uh, an interesting little side point was we had an engineer, because uh, we bought out a company that made cranes. And uh, this man was one of their engineers for the cranes. So when we had uh, field problems, a crane would break down uh, and there'd be a lawsuit about somebody getting hurt or killed and so forth. 
he more or less took care of the engineering side of responding. And because he uh, had a lot of calculating work to do, um, well, I don't know how he really got into that, but he had two mechanical calculators. One, I think, was a Monroe and one was a Frieden, if I remember right. And they were his little pet toys. And uh, so we utilized his facilities because when we're designing front end loaders or dozers in particular, you want to get the weight distribution. Uh, well, and even front end loaders, you want enough weight on the back end so the thing doesn't tip when you take up a load in the scoop. Uh, so he would do the calculating on the beginning designs. He'd, he'd try to calculate that out. And the interesting thing was, you know, here's a machine that's 10, 12 feet long and uh, thousands of pounds of machine. And he'd run it on a calculator and he'd run it out to the 10th decimal point because he liked to see it run. Because <laughs> it was a mechanical, it run, crank, 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 you know. And uh, so he'd say, uh, you need a balance of, out there of uh, 1,102 pounds. Point three, <laughs> and 1100 was a close enough answer <laughs> for that particular reason. But anyway, was, he was an interesting guy. He he died while I was there because uh, he was older. And but uh, also, I was given an engineer because by this time uh, we were beginning to have a lot of them out on the market. And they would fail and have pieces. They needed this or they needed that, or they'd need a new radiator, a new fan, new whatever. And we had a supply company in Chicago that took care of all the contacts for, for service. But they got to realizing that, well, this guy wants this radiator with the entrance here, and this guy over here needs the same radiator, but the entrance is a different place. So we've got to stock both of those can't we come up with kits or something that can make these adaptable? So they gave me an engineer who had been working with those machines too, along with this other fellow. And uh, he uh, was our service engineer. And he would uh, design adaptations that would work and make uh, reduce the number they had to carry on inventory. So it's another side of engineering that you think, oh, well, you're designing big fancy machines or doing this, that, and the other, but there is a, another kind of engineering work that needs to be done. Um, then uh, we begin to, as I mentioned earlier, we got into copier machines and uh, we were into microfilm about that time. And so we got into, we had to get uh, set up for microfilm. We had to have a big camera set up in order to take the engineering drawings that were up to, uh, what's this, uh, probably about five feet in size and shrink them down to a little card and they'd put it in a little micro, uh, IBM card, cut a hole in it, you could buy these from the companies that were selling this equipment and mount the film in there and so forth. So that was part of my responsibility, to take care of all the things other than engineering. Well, this supported engineering, but it wasn't the engineering. So uh, I had to learn about those. So what I said earlier was, you never know the things you're gonna have to do in later life, because it didn't exist when I started. Uh, there was no microfilm. Oh yes, people took pictures and things, but uh, to get 35 millimeter film to take that, that much reduction was quite a task. But then we had to have abilities to uh, punch the holes in those cards to identify them because they would run them through sorters. We had to get a sorter so we could sort our own cards to, because we filed the cards. The big reason for microfilm was our overseas work. It was costing us a lot of money to ship full-size drawings overseas. And uh, so the, this was a way to reduce that. And we did that. 
The hardest part was, in a sense, was making prints from those. Because if you wanted to re-enlarge it, you had to get a big enlarger camera and stuff. But they began to come out, other companies, with uh, equipment that would take the microfilm and expand it into a, uh, a drawing of, of uh, what was called a C-sized drawing, which was equivalent of about three eight and a half by 11 sheets, fairly good size. And that was usable for the engineers. And so our engineers then were told, look, you can't, we aren't gonna run prints off on our print machine, a blueprint machine or white print, as I said earlier, uh, which is what we had, but our shop needs those. So we still had to have that equipment and we had the microfilm equipment and, and filing and, and so forth. Uh, in time, that led to, we've got to protect this stuff from getting fi a fire hazard, burn these originals, and then where are we at? Because we still have, we, uh, theoretically, the overseas people could, but we didn't build everything overseas that we built in here. So they said, we've got to do something for that, and there came up a, a request to investigate that. So I got to go on an interesting trip to, I think it was Kansas, where they had a salt mine, and they stored these things down in the salt mine, about 600 feet under the earth. <laughs> and uh, down there, what got it was, the first people that were in there, I think, were Hollywood people, wanted to keep their films. They had a whole section for their film. And then we'd rent space. I don't think we ever used it. We, we looked at it, we were looking at some other options and some of our own options and so forth. But that was the one. So along about this time, computers began to really take off. And uh, they finally came out with how they could make drawings on computers. But at first it was special little drawing programs and so forth and all. But then there began to be companies that made the equipment and so forth. So I did a lot of research on that in order to find out what we ought to do. And this began to get to be a real problem for the company because now uh, we had divisions at Battle Creek. We had a division at, um, on the uh, East Coast or Southeast, um, and as well as the overseas people. And these divisions would wanna use the same parts because we got into a parts classification system. Because so, sometimes there would be the same spring that would work here, would work in a forklift, would work in another machine. And so we would try to reduce the inventory. So you get into a lot of things like that, but then they, uh, but we also, our transmissions were made in Jackson, our axles were made in Buchanan, our, uh, other parts were sometimes in other cities or something. So you'd have to send them drawings and then they'd have to, and so we were making regular drawings and then we got to microfilm, we'd send them microfilm, but we had to be sure we were all using the same kind of readers and microfilm equipment and so forth. And so standardization again get into the picture. And we, they had, Battle Creek had done some work on that uh, earlier in terms of bolts and nuts, the obvious things. Uh, but uh, then we started throwing in some extra things that we needed and so forth. So we began to develop a, uh, a standardization committee of which uh, Battle Creek Man was the head of it at that time. Eventually I became the head of that standardization for all the com but the standardization then went one step further. Now we're gonna make these drawings on computers and that's got to be able to be read by a program that's a different program over on this computer. Uh, we still have that problem today. Uh, I have it, uh, I, I do a letter and, and send it out, email, and they can't read it. 
and uh, other people can uh, have those problems. So uh, we were working on that when we were trying to come up with drafting equipment for computers. And uh, finally we had to convince management that we could not restrict manufacturing on what equipment they bought, computer controlled equipment, because they could make pins and burn plates and do all kinds of things with computer-aided equipment, but it wasn't, they needed a drawing that this computer could read and make that. And so this company would make drawings, but this one would make different drawings. So we had a problem with that, but finally we convinced management that there could be, and we demonstrated some of it in a minor way, uh, that could read the information and reinterpret it. And uh, we finally got our own equipment and uh, Battle Creek had gotten their own equipment, but uh, we were, oh, and our Buchanan engineers for axles had their equipment and it turned out that things for for various reasons, I think Battle Creek maybe got sold. Anyway, we got consolidated management-wise with Buchanan. And uh, when we did that, they had different equipment to draw their drawings. And when we were gonna put an axle under in, a, in another drawing, why do we have to redraw it? They've already drawn it once. We wanna put it in our computer and it's combined. Well, at first we found that there was a converter that worked, but it didn't, and we had meanwhile bought equipment that did our work on, on computer. And so we'd take their cards, put them in our computer, and we'd get them out, but the text wouldn't come out. So I had a fellow there that had taken training also, because I was at this point so involved with things that I didn't get into the individual training uh, on it. but. Uh, he had learned uh, how to program the computer. And we found out how their computer put the characters, and so he wrote a program that would change the characters from one to the other so that a four over here appeared as a four over here, and so forth. And so we began to convince management that there was that possibility that you could convert these drawings. and. Uh, but about that time I retired and they went on to other things. Uh, the, our plant in, Benton, in uh, Benton Harbor was sold and, and moved to Ohio. And uh, that's when they said, well, do you wanna move or you wanna retire? <laughs> we'll give you a package because I was only a year or so away from retirement at that point. So I went down there a few times and dealt with them and so forth. But it's a big job combining companies. And uh, so anyway, uh, that's kind of my story of, and, and what do you suppose that I did when I retired? I did finally get to do some teaching. I taught here five years uh, at uh, Andrews and uh, taught engineering classes on a adjunct basis. And, uh, I, of course, in church, taught Sabbath school and things like that. But uh, because of my management experience, I dealt with a lot of projects and money and so forth. Uh, I mean, designing a machine is one thing, but when you're trying to run a department, we'd get, uh, we'd get government contracts for machines, but they'd have this special, that special, in other words. So we had a whole department that just about 50 people that did that. And that was in another building in Benton Harbor. It was sort of, I was supposed to be kind of watching over that. Uh, oh, <laughs> yeah, I got into uh, project control using a computer. And that was quite a thing that none of us had really worked with. So you have a lot of different things that you face in life, but then when I got out, I thought, well, I'll do consulting. Well, that didn't work out too well. I did a little of it. And uh, 
but uh, before long my church said they wanted me to be a treasurer. And so I ended up being treasurer for 20 some years. I finally retired from that, got somebody else to do it. Nobody wanted to do it. But life is not predictable. We have to be flexible and let God lead in our work processes.